So Jeremiah covered pretty much everything there is to know about me. Um, that's it. You know my life story. Um, I'll add one thing real quick. Um, I was originally raised in a small town in Wisconsin, about probably an hour and a half, maybe two hours north of here. Um, the claim to fame to this town is that it's the hometown of Tony Romo. And if you say that to people in the town, you get a mixed reaction. Because some people are like, oh, yeah, Tony Romo. And other people are like, oh, Cowboys. Um, because the Cowboys fans up there are really obnoxious. Um, <laughs> I love a good story. Um, and, and who among us doesn't? Like, I'm constantly watching movies, as I'm sure many of us are. Uh, but I sometimes feel like maybe I'm watching too many. Um, like, maybe every night that might be a little too many. Um, but through watching a lot of movies, reading a lot of books, um, reading a lot of just ancient stories and studying the craft of storytelling, I've learned that a lot of stories, maybe pretty much all stories, have a few things in common, but one that's really important. Um, whether it's Darth Vader choosing to save Luke and kill the Emperor at the end of Return of the Jedi, or Frodo getting to Mount Doom and choosing to give in to the influence of the ring, um, or Peter Parker choosing to follow the path of great responsibility after the death of his Uncle Ben, or to keep it even, because I've got some positive and some negative here, uh, Michael Corleone deciding whether or not to avenge his brother and go down the path that leads him to become the Don of the Corleone family. Uh, every, every story has one of these compelling decisions that a uh, character has to make. Uh, there's a decision often between good and evil, an individual act um, that they do, right, wrong, good, evil, and it often determines the path the rest of their story takes. The reason that I start that way is because I believe that this story is that moment for Jacob. And uh, before I kind of dive in, I'll give you a glimpse of what's coming so you know uh, kind of where we're headed. I'm going to start with a brief summary of the story thus far, in case you haven't been here for the entire thing, or just need a refresher on uh, what's happened so far. Uh, and then I'm going to dive into the text, break it down one or two verses at a time, offer a little bit of commentary and some thoughts. Uh, and then I'll finish with three takeaways. Why three? Because I was raised in a Baptist church, and you can take the boy out of the, or out of the Baptist church, but you can't take the Baptist church out of the boy. Yeah. <laughs> So, to, uh, we'll start here with this uh, summary of Jacob's story so far. Uh, recall that he's the younger of two twins. He was born to Isaac and Rebekah, um, and he was born grasping the heel of his elder brother. Uh, in fact, his name literally means grasper uh, in Hebrew, and then we're told in the text that it figuratively means something like deceiver. Uh, both of these things, to use movie terms, uh, both of these things describe the first and second acts of Jacob's life. During the first act, he spends these uh, first several decades of his life kind of grasping for a birthright and blessing that maybe didn't belong to him, uh, but he really wanted. God said he would get it, um, but man, Isaac wasn't intending on giving it to him, uh, so his mother and him schemed to get those things from his brother Esau. Does not go over well. Uh, Esau is not fond of the fact that Jacob deceives him and steals not only birthright, but also blessing from him. He gets very mad, uh, and Jacob actually has to flee from Canaan, from his father's encampment, in order to save his life. Uh, and then later in the second act, um, he deceives his uncle Laban in order to make himself a much richer man, uh, grasping and taking Laban's wealth for himself. At the time, or we know afterwards that it's really God intervening, allowing Jacob to take Laban's wealth, but Jacob's motivation is to take Laban's wealth under his own power, and I think that's what's important. Um, and along the way, Jacob marries two women who are the daughters of Laban, Leah and Rachel, and uh, he ends up having 12 children at this point, 11 sons and one daughter. And then God appears to him in a vision, telling him to return home. So as he nears Canaan, he sends word to Esau that he's returning, and then receives word back that Esau's gathered 400 men and is heading towards Jacob's cohort. It's not a good sign. I'm thinking, if I'm away for 20 years uh, because someone's really mad at me, and then I come back mm -hmm. and I hear that they've sent 400 men mm -hmm. to greet me, I'm thinking it's not 
a greeting. Um, or if it is, it's a Chicago handshake, which if you don't know what that is, go in for a handshake with a gun underneath. I'm, th I'm thinking swords out, spears out. It's not going to end well for me. So <laughs> we'll dive into the text here. I'm going to read it again, verse by verse, just to call it back to mind. So we'll start in uh, verse 22. Uh, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. There's a couple things that I want to bring out here. Um, Jacob, like when he fled from Esau the first time, because Esau's rightfully mad, uh, and when he fled from Laban, not even because Laban's mad, but because the sons of Laban are mad, and Jacob's a little worried about what's going to happen there. Uh, he's allowing himself to be governed by fear. Uh, fear of Esau in the first time, fear of Laban and Laban's sons the second time, and now again, fear of Esau. Maybe well-deserved, like I said, I'm thinking, it's 400 people probably have swords, they're probably not too happy. Esau's probably not too happy to see me. Um, it's been 20 years, and it really looks like Esau's grudge hasn't faded, it's only grown with time. Um, and then the second thing, uh, that I, or, yeah, the second thing I want to draw out here is that it's really worth noting that the mention of the eleven sons is, is really key here, I think, to the understanding the entire meaning of the passage. Um, remember, I said that Jacob has twelve children at this point, eleven sons and one daughter. The eleven sons, I think it's foreshadowing, maybe should preface this with a little spoiler alert for what's about to come in the story. Jacob's about to be uh, renamed to Israel. And what do we know about his 11 sons? They become the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. So I think that what's going on here is the author is kind of foreshadowing that, saying, hey, pay attention to these 11 sons who are be the 11 tribes because something really neat is about to happen. And the final thing that I think is, is really key here is that sending everything across the river and away from himself really symbolically places all of Jacob's possessions under the care of God. Um, which shows how he, his faith has developed. We've seen little bits and pieces along the way of uh, how Jacob has started to trust God, maybe by changing from saying, oh, the God of my fathers to my God. Or even last week, we saw that he uncharacteristically prays for deliverance from Israel. And I think that this is another example of that, where he pushes everything away and he's alone by himself in the wilderness. So continuing on in the passage, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This is the second time that Jacob's alone in the wilderness, uh, while fleeing from his brother, uh, ironically, both times. Uh, to remind you, the first time is in chapter 28, and that's found verses 10 through 21. Uh, and in both cases, he really experiences something quite strange. Uh, the first time, he's given a vision of angels ascending and descending a ziggurat, which if you look in your translation, it says ladder, maybe staircase. Uh, there's a discussion around what this means. It's likely a ziggurat, which is a Mesopotamian uh, temple, kind of like a pyramid, a stared pyramid. Uh, and the thought behind it is that you'd build this and it would compel a divine being to come down this staircase and dwell in a temple that was often built next to it in order to bring blessing to your land. And so I think that the angels ascending and descending this ziggurat is a sign that is pointing to the fact that Jacob can't control God. Uh, if he can't even control these lesser divine beings that are angels, what makes him think that he can control God? I think it also says that uh, he can't even so much as try by his own scheming to make God's will happen. Like I mentioned, God said Jacob is going to be the favored son. The older will serve the younger. Esau will serve Jacob. Jacob will be the child of promise. But as we heard a couple weeks ago from Pastor Steve, this lesson really didn't take... Uh, Jacob continued to scheme, this, this time to take Laban's wealth. First he takes Esau's wealth and promise of wealth, and then he takes Laban's wealth as well. Now back to the text. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. This is a really interesting imagery. Uh, some of the other translations don't say, like, touched, touched, I feel like, is this really soft kind of thing. Some of the other translations kind of give this idea of just like a full-on punch oh. right to the hip. Um, imagine that you're like struggling with somebody and all of a sudden you just get a sucker punch to the hip. That's going to hurt. Um, hips are, are pretty sensitive. Uh, I work in 
the produce department of a grocery store and I do a lot of lifting boxes, I can tell you when I drop something on my hip, it does not feel good. Um, and this is also a really important key part of this passage. This hip injury is something Jacob would have for the rest of his life. Uh, and there's a couple of ideas as to what this injury means. Um, the first is because of the hip's proximity to maybe let's call it the means of reproduction to be polite. Uh, this has something to do with Jacob's virility and the continuation of his line. Hmm. This is not really a baseless conclusion because after all, earlier when an oath was sworn between Abraham and his servant, uh, the Bible says that it was sworn by the servant placing his hand under Abraham's thigh. Friends, this is the Bible being polite. <laughs> so maybe this is the same thing, right? Uh, the lingering hip injuries connected to Jacob's virility, Bible's being polite. So maybe this is, has the meaning of, okay, symbolically your, your line is closed. Maybe literally your line is closed. Um, and I think, I think we're onto something here. Like, case closed. Everyone knows that Jacob had 11 sons uh, and one daughter, and his line was done. Except that Jacob had a 12th son, Benjamin, who's really important. He's one of the two tribes to return from exile. And into the New Testament, uh, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, and Paul's of the tribe of Benjamin, and they seem to have a very special relationship compared to the other apostles. Huh. Benjamin is super important, and he's not born for a couple chapters yet, many years. So maybe it's not about virility after all. Here's what I think. Last week, we heard about Jacob uncharacteristically choosing to pray from deliverance from Esau, uh, which signals a change in his posture and, and the way he views his relationship with God. However, like I mentioned a bit ago, this isn't the first time that he's done that. Uh, and these things tend not to stick for him. Um, he goes back and forth all the time. Am I going to trust God? I'm, I'm going to trust God for right now. No, I'm going to trust myself now. Um, just back and forth. So this time, Jacob's given a permanent physical reminder of this change in his posture so that he remembers, okay, I'm going to keep my trust in God. And Dr. Michael Heiser, who's an Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern scholar, uh, puts it this way. He says, of all the biblical figures that might need reminding of a relationship they have with God and the responsibilities in that relationship, it might be this guy Jacob. Again, because of the flip-flopping back and forth. We go back to the text. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. By mentioning daybreak, this divine being is revealing his nature. In the ancient world, gods lived in places that humans didn't. And the reason is so that belief in these gods could continue. Oh, you believe in Ra? Well, how do you know? Have you, have you ever seen Ra? Well, no, of course. Ra lives in places where I don't. He still exists, he just exists outside of what I can observe. Hmm. And the, some examples of these places are in the wilderness, on mountains, and even at night. Uh, and we have this tradition in, in Western literature, too. Think back to fairy tales and other forms of Western folklore. Uh, daybreaks are often the moment where powers and creatures lose their ability to affect the world of humans. Hmm. Um, and it's because Jacob's a smart guy. He's grown up in this culture. He knows that daybreak is when the gods and powers and monsters no longer can affect the physical world. And so he realizes at this point the nature of this being that he's struggling against, namely that it's a divine being. And he asks it for a blessing. Um, and there's a couple maybe reasons for this. It's possible that uh, maybe he's feeling guilty about uh, the way that he got his first blessing. Um, or maybe it's just customary and we don't have any record of it to ask for blessings from people. No matter what, uh, the divine being requires that in order to get this blessing, no matter what Jacob's motivation is, the divine being says, Jacob, say your name. And by making him say his name, the godly being is making Jacob face who he was. Saying his name meant revealing his nature. Uh, like, like I said at the beginning, Jacob means uh, grasper or deceiver. And by saying this out loud, Jacob has to come to terms with who he was, who he is, what he's done, and really throughout his life, who he's been to 
himself and to other people before he can receive new direction and become who he's meant to be. I think this is key. If you remember nothing else, remember this, that Jacob has to identify who he was before he could become who he's meant to be. This new name also has a different function as well. Uh, a common thing in the ancient Near East and even into uh, the Middle Ages in Europe is to give, is for a uh, a king of a larger kingdom to come in and say, hey, smaller kingdom, I'm going to support you. And king of the smaller kingdom, I'm going to rename you to remind you of your required loyalty to me. Remind you of the fact that I'm going to support you, I'm going to help you, but you have to be loyal to me. And there's uh, some conversation uh, speculating that maybe this is what's going on as well, that this divine being now has power over or maybe requires loyalty uh, on the part of Jacob. And then finally, this new name given to Jacob is an external indicator of internal change. Uh, much like the change from Abram to Abraham, which is, side note, a much less dramatic change. I can't speak for Hebrew, but in Greek it goes from Abram to Abraham. That's not, that's not super, super different. Um, but like that change, this change from Jacob to Israel marks the entering of a person into covenant relationship with God. And then this name Israel is incredibly meaningful. As it says in the text, uh, your name will be Israel because you've struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And this is going to be the pattern of Israel's history forever, really. Uh, think of few generations after Jacob, they're enslaved, the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and they have to struggle under this labor, and then struggle to get out. They have to struggle in the wilderness for 40 years, they have to struggle against the nations that inhabit Canaan in order to um, be able to build their civilization in the Holy Land. They have to struggle against uh, Egypt again later on in their history, and Assyria and Babylon, which are empires rising in the east that actually eventually overtake Israel. Uh, Assyria overtakes the northern ten tribes, and Judah over, or <laughs> Babylon overtakes Judah, which is the two southern tribes. This is many, many centuries of struggle and triumph, and struggle, and struggle, and struggle, and struggle, and struggle. And this is both with God and with other nations. Go back to the text here. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Seems like an interesting detail to include, but it's one that maybe I resonate with a little bit. Um, Jacob had to identify himself, so it's really only fair to ask the same of his opponent as well. There's a couple reasons I could think of. Um, maybe he wants to confirm his suspicions. Like, he only just kind of has an inkling of an idea that this whole daybreak thing means that this really is a divine being. And he wants confirmation of that. Um, or maybe he's fishing for further revelation, because only an idiot would face a divine being and not try to get more revelation from them. We'll finish up the passage here. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Again, this is another weird inclusion. Um, kind of seems maybe not so attached to the rest of the story. This is actually a dietary restriction that's not repeated anywhere else in the Torah, uh, not in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy. It only occurs here. And so it really seems like this may have been a long-standing custom of the nation of Israel, even back to the pre-law days. And the author of Genesis just wants to provide an explanation for it, either because this story really is the explanation for it, or because this story is a good example, uh, a good story to tie it to, a story that makes sense, a story that everyone's familiar with. Both are, are equally valid and very common explanations for uh, customs in the ancient world. And then I want to finish just uh, with three applications. And earlier I said you can't take the Baptist out of the boy. I really tried to make these three, uh, what's the word when they all start with the same letter? Alliterative. Alliterative. Uh, I couldn't do that, but they all start with vowels. So I figured that was good enough. Um, so the first of my application is an observation. 
uh, about the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a whole. Uh, the second is an encouragement about uh, the life of faith, our life of faith, their life of faith, the life of faith of the New Testament, uh, and a relationship with God. And the third is an action that I believe that the text is uh, not only calling Jacob to, but also calling everyone who reads the story to as well. So the first, we'll start with the observation, and that, that is that God often appears as we need him to in order to best get our attention. Um, and this is an observation about the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also of the whole of the Bible. Um, a godly being appears in human form in human form twice in the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The rest of the time is all visions. Uh, the first is to Abraham, and the second is to Jacob. And both times, at first, he doesn't know, or the the human character doesn't know that this is a divine being that they're speaking to. Abraham, who is a gentle and generous host, hosts a few divine beings in his encampment. This is right before Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. He doesn't know who they are. He sees them walking and he says, hey, come here, let me feed you. And then through the course of the story, it is revealed to him that this is a divine being, or several divine beings. Um, maybe God and two angels, maybe three angels, one speaking with the authority of God. It doesn't really matter for the point of the story. The point is that God is speaking to Abraham. On the other hand, Jacob is young, aggressive, confrontational, headstrong, and sly. And as we see in the story, he literally wrestles with a divine being. Um, this occurs elsewhere, too, uh, in a slightly different fashion. God appears to Moses as a burning bush, which is just really weird. I don't know that it has any connection to to, Joseph, or to Moses' story in any other way, apart from just, here, look at this weird thing, and getting attention that way. As they come out of Egypt, the Israelites see God as two pillars, one of fire to light the way at night, and one of cloud to show the way during the day. And this is something that they need needed to be able to find the way out of Egypt. He sends a warrior spirit to encourage Joshua before the Battle of Jericho. Again, another thing, if you think back to that story, Joshua says something to the effect of, who are you going to fight for? Are you going to fight for us? The angelic being says, no, but know that God is on your side, and here's how he wants you to do it. And then at the crux of history, when tensions in, in Judea were boiling and revolution against the Roman Empire seemed to be inevitable, uh, God appeared as a meek carpenter who preached peace and died to forgive the sins of the world. And then the second application, uh, this one is an encouragement, um, that God really wants us to struggle with him. We don't have to feel bad about pushing back against things that we maybe feel God pushing us towards. I, I want to call to mind 1 Philippians 2.12, where Paul says, Work out your faith with fear and trembling. This really sounds kind of like this idea of struggling with God to me. Um, I think Paul is saying that every person has to decide for themselves what it is that they believe and own up to it, uh, just like Jacob's done over these past few chapters. There's a broad swath of Christian orthodoxy. Um, you have the capital O Orthodox Church, a Greek and Eastern. You have the Catholic Church. You have Protestant denominations. And oh, are there a lot of Protestant denominations? All of them have some amount of truth to them. And it all depends on what we feel God leading us towards. Each and every one of us has that ability and maybe even the responsibility to decide the nature of our relationship, whether that's through uh, what kind of church we go to or how we worship. Um, what sort of things we feel called to do outside of church. We all have to believe, or we all have to decide and wrestle with God to determine what it is we believe about God and how people should live and, and so on, really. Um, but at the same time, we also need to be careful. As we saw here, Jacob is crippled for the rest of his life after this struggle. When you contend with the divine, you really need to watch out and be careful. I'm reminded of a quote from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, Susan Pavensi had just learned that Aslan's a lion, and not a man like she would previously thought. She had heard some things about how good uh, Aslan is and, and says, oh, well, he's a man. And so she asks, you know, given that he's a lion, is, is he safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. 
the God we serve, the God that we struggle with, is not safe. When we struggle, we can get hurt. But God and his divine messengers are good. They want the best for us. They want to guide us through this journey. The thing that Jacob wrestles with is, is dangerous, but it's good. Ultimately, it, it is revealed that this is God, or perhaps a mouthpiece of God, who is calling Jacob back to him, back to relationship with him. And then finally, I want to... Uh, this is probably the most important point that I have. Uh, this is the action. Um, and this, again, goes back to what I said was most important when I was going through the text. And that is, to get where we're going, we need to identify where we've been. Jacob saying his name out loud is really more than just him providing his identity. In the West, like, some of our names have meanings, but not as deep as, as these Hebraic names that we read about in the beginning of the Old Testament especially. Um, Jacob has deep intrinsic meaning. It really is a name that's about Jacob. It's not just how he's identified. So by saying it out loud, this is a confession of his nature, uh, showing where he's been. And then after confessing this, then a godly being gives him a new name and thus new direction in life. So to be able to move forward in life, we really need to accept who we are, who we were, who maybe without, if, if uh, nobody intervenes, maybe who we would become, and identify our flaws before God. And then to use the language of the New Testament, we need to repent, and then God will give us a new direction in life and show us where it is that we need to go. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the the great weather. I uh, thank you that it's not too hot, um, but that it's still really nice weather to be outside. And I thank you for your word and for the, the stories in your word that can teach us about the world and the way that we are meant to live. Um, I pray that everyone would, would remember and take away today that um, that we can struggle with you. Uh, and that it's it's okay to struggle with you, that um, when we struggle, that you want what's best for us, um, but you'll still allow us to, to struggle and maybe hurt ourselves in the process. And I pray that you would remind each and every one of us uh, in the coming weeks, months, and years that uh, we need to be constantly, we need to be people of repentance, uh, constantly turning away from our our own desires and towards what you want for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Will you all please stand for this last song?